lived on this campus. Our keynote speaker this evening is Sister Mary Beth Lloyd, religious teacher of the Filipino religious community, and most certainly an outrageous woman of God, whose life work we will hope inspire our students to serve the most vulnerable among us. We hope you enjoy this evening and this event and come back to visit us often and enjoy Franciscan hospitality. And now, with any further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ann Prisco, President of Felician University for Word of Malton. Dr. Prisco. Thank you, Mary, and welcome everyone. So I have the distinct pleasure of getting to welcome everyone this evening and giving you a little background of, of why this lecture and why this solution involved in this lecture. So first, I'd like to give a very warm welcome and thanks to those from the Order of Malta, Reverend Monsignor William Podrowski, the chaplain of the, Malta, of the Order of Malta, and Dr. Richard Wolf the Order of Malta Knight of Justice. If I could please ask you to stand and any other members of the Order of Malta. And now to speak about out outrageous women of God. We're very happy to have the Philippine sisters with us this evening. I want to give special recognition to Dr. Sister Senza Tizano. Where's Sister Senza? Mary DeBacco, it was under Sister Mary's leadership that at the time when the Ministries to AIDS Orphans was developed. So I'd like to thank all of the sisters, and with Sister Mary Beth, the speaker this evening. All the Filipino sisters, and when we talk about outrageous women of God, <laughs> but our police sisters also stand in the <laughs> So, folks, an amazing statistic. Between these two religious order of sisters, they have been providing 464 years of service in the community. So we're very, very grateful to all, all of you. Talk about social justice in action. So the other thing we should do is thank those folks here at the college who work at the university who organize this every year. So certainly Dr. Mary Norton, uh, Mary Zukowski, Liz Marish will be coming up to do the invocation and all of the, the group that participates in what we call, we call the Franciscan Task Force. They plan this event every year, so we're very grateful to all of them. I get to stand up here and say everything, and they do all the hard work. <laughs> so I thought I'd do a little bit of a brief history of why do we do this lecture here at Appalachian University. So this is a focus on social justice and why social justice. Well, in 1991, Pope John Paul II issued an encyclical. So what's a papal encyclical? It's basically a letter to the bishops, and sometimes it's directed to bishops of a specific country, but it basically re reiterates or states the position and guidance to the bishops about how they should lead their congregations. And in this particular encyclical, it was in 1991, and it had been 100 years since Pope Leo had issued his encyclical on social justice. So, you know, John Paul decided it was due for a refresh. So in 1991, he issued what was called the Centesimus Honor. That was his encyclical, and it was also focused on social justice. So it's on, hmm, of all years, during this year of really discussions about, uh, certainly during the presidential debates, about what is justice and social justice, I thought I would talk a little bit about what did John Paul define as social justice in his comments to the bishops. So this, this is some of the quotes from the encyclical. It examines the role of the state and the economy from the perspective of Catholic moral theology. John Paul affirms Leo VIII's teachings that there should be, one, rights for people who work, 
including the right to private property and the right to a family supporting wage. And that individuals and families should be served by the economy rather than the reverse. That individuals and families should be served by the economy rather than the reverse. He strongly rejects the idea that socialism is the proper response to current economic conditions. He then argues that the state should assist workers as they participate in economic life. The state should adopt measures to help those who become unemployed and encourage proper wage levels. However, the state should not be so extensive as to discourage individual initiatives in the economy. In response to the Pope's call to spread the, rich, the Church's rich teachings on social justice, the U.S. Catholic bishops asked Catholic universities to offer programs in their communities which would educate the laity about these issues. And thus was the birth of this program here at Felician University. So 2008, we had our first inaugural <coughs> lecture. And at that time, it was a panel. They decided to bring in four different sectors to represent four different constituents and discuss what social justice meant with them. After that, it was decided it was a much more effective approach to have one speaker every year to really focus on a particular topic, such as we're doing tonight. So I want to give credit to the Franciscan Task Force, which over the years has really developed the program and thought about what was going on in our times and how could we relate that to what John Paul II was teaching us through this encyclical. We've been very lucky that since 2010, the Order of Malta has generously been co-sponsoring. So for now, for the, this is the sixth year that you're co-sponsoring, and it's been, you've provided over $10,000 in funding, and for that, we're very appreciative. And given today's geopolitical, economic climate, and all of the discussions that are going on, isn't it appropriate that we as a Catholic institution continue to focus on, that it's an imperative that we consider social justice issues. So I welcome you all. I'm glad you're here, and I look forward to a stimulating presentation. Thank you.
started at Bill Walsh Academy. As a matter of fact, there are a number of sisters I could introduce you to <laughs> who are uh, sisters that we got to know from Bill Walsh Academy. And I thought maybe the best way to do this, and don't panic, was to call my daughter Jessica and ask her what she thought what I should say. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Jessica, wise woman that she is, Bill Walsh alumna, her first response was that Sister Mary Beth cultivated or helped to cultivate in her a love for chemistry and for the beauty that occurs when elements combine to form new compounds and reactions. And if you ever met my daughter Jessica, you would know that those are her war words, right, sister? <laughs> um, she also talked about the way that sister coached the cross-country team not from the sidelines, but running with the girls during practices and by signing everybody on the team up to participate in the various 5 and 10K races out in the Marstown area that were run for charity, including Sister. Um, Sister's modeling of both her love for learning and her understanding of the ways to put one's talents and abilities at the service of others gave my daughter and so many other young women, an introduction to ways of being outrageous in their life's journeys. Outrageous meaning not conventional or matter of fact. Like St. Lucy Filippini and Blessed Mary Angela, the foundresses of the religious teachers Filippini and the Felician sisters, Sister Mary Beth empowered my daughter and her other students to think outside the box and to use their knowledge, their talents, and their God-given gifts to do the unconventional in service to others, kind of like a nun running a marathon in full habit in order to make money for children. <laughs> Today, here in New Jersey, Sister continues to cultivate the working vineyard of the Lord by reaching out to the underserved families of Newark and Morris County through the John Core Family Resource Center, a project of the Religious Teachers Filipini. The work of this organization runs, ranges from hosting Christmas parties in Newark to literacy fairs in Morristown, where children can not only pick out and take home their favorite books, but have their eyes examined and be issued library cards. Parents are able to register to vote if eligible, and clothing and diapers are provided for those who may need them. My husband, at this time, is one of the John Core road dogs. <laughs> road dogs. These folks, Sister Mary Beth included, pick up and deliver furniture to families in need, mostly in Newark. And just so you don't think that Sister's outrageousness stopped when she left the classroom, my husband tells a story of making a delivery of a truck full of furniture to a family in Newark who had committed to having someone there to assist in bringing the furniture up three flights of stairs in a walk-up apartment house. Well, when the trio of road dogs got there and had the furniture and the truckload of furniture, no one was there to help. The sister got out of the truck, looked around, and saw a Verizon repairman. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you guessed it, before the man knew it, he was calling it. <laughs> All of this is to say that our presenter this evening is someone who lives out her baptismal call and the call of her consecrated community life according to the commission that we all receive at the end of each celebration of you. <coughs> Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Sister Mary Beth Lloyd is a sister of the Institute of Religious Teachers Filipini in Morristown, New Jersey. She has taught elementary, high school, elementary and high school science. Sister received a doctorate from Columbia University in nutrition and public health and worked at Sloan at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York. In 1994, Sister was appointed Secretary to Mother General and Mission Office Director for the Institute in Rome, Italy. As Mission Office Director, she helps single mothers, women and girls at risk, 
and often. She has helped develop programs to aid the child-headed household. But that, those are brothers and sisters who are left often by AIDS and HIV. Um, and that work now has become a priority for the Institute of the Religious Teachers Filipini. Sisters' experiences in Albania, Brazil, Ethiopia, Eritrea, and India inspired the writing of the book you received along with your program, AIDS, Orphans Rising. Currently, here in New Jersey, Sisters' work includes the Filipini-sponsored John Core Family Resource Center, which serves families in Newark and Morristown. She is working not only to provide God's love, food, clothing, and education for children, but most of all, to give children and families hope for a future of peace. With that said, I ask you to please welcome our speaker this evening, Sister Mary Beth Lloyd. Thank you very much, Billy. Thank you for the wonderful prayer, also. Beautiful. Uh, good evening, Dr. Fisco. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> All the administrators here at Felician. All the Felician sisters, this is great so many of you showed up. And I, I congratulate you. I know it was a contest because you didn't want to have more Filipino sisters here. <laughs> but, but you're here. And I congratulate you because you've gone from a normal school to a college to a university, which I hope is also a normal school. Right? <laughs> it, it, it's, it's incredible that uh, the thousands of students that the Felician sisters have been able to help, and now you good lay people are able to continue on the good work that they've done. The Knights of Malta, how wonderful. Thank you for supporting this. And we see the work of Knights of Malta throughout the world. They're not, you know, they're not just here in the United States, they're, they're worldwide, so we thank you for that. The dear Filipini sisters who've come to support me and cheer me on, I thank you very much for coming. It's a great support. Uh, the Christian Charity Sisters, I can't leave them out sitting here, it's so good. And I'll talk a little bit about them later when we get to work in New Jersey here. But let's uh, see if I left anybody else out. All you invited guests who have come, thank you. And the most important, the Felician students, all right? Because that's why I'm here. I'm here to help you understand uh, what this poor world is going through and how you can make it a better world. That's what we want you to do. All right. So when, when they, uh, Sylvia first invited me and I went and I asked Sister Ashenza, I said, uh, you know, they've asked me to speak at the Felician University. And she said, oh, that's great. They had uh, Father James Martin last year and he spoke, you know, he's the author of America <laughs> Magazine and all that. <laughs> you know, and I said, all right, well, we'll do the best we can do here. <laughs> and then, then I got your folder and it said Outrageous Women. And I was like, oh. So I Google the word outrageous, and outrageous search says that, uh, I mean, Google search says that outrageous means shockingly bad and excessive. <laughs> oh, that's the kind of talk they want. <laughs> but then I looked into Merriam-Webster, and it says, as Sylvia said, not conventional and standing out. And right away, my mind went to the Latin. The Latin for standing out is ex stare, which is the same word for exist. So if we, if I exist, and it means outrageous, and I guess I am outrageous, but then all of you are also outrageous, all right? And what we want to do, we want to exist at, in, the, in the best way that we possibly can, all right? So the human journey, this human journey cannot be stopped. It's going on with or without us, all right? What's so curious to me in the United States, it's called the human race. Right? And it's the only country in the world that has a monument called Rushmore. <laughs> if we do a little anthropology, all right? Anthropology. Man at first hummed, then he sang, then he spoke, then he wrote, then he texted, and then we do selfies. <laughs> For years, <laughs> for years, the number one magazine was old people, what was it? Life, Time. then it became people, then it became us, and today the number one magazine is self. Does that scare you? <laughs> Selfies, self magazine. The true reason can be snuffed out by selfishness. 
And I think this is what's driving Pope Francis in almost every one of his documents. He's saying, you know, if you don't have room for people in your life, if you're too busy with your own concerns and interests, you have no room for others and you have no room for the poor. So if you want to live a dignified and fulfilling life, you have to reach out for others and you have to seek their good. Good. Talmud, Old Testament, what did it say? Love your neighbor as yourself. All right. Man had to come so unloving that Jesus had to come, and what did he say? He said, no, don't love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as I have loved you. All right. Love is so powerful, and without love you can't exist. But how do you learn to love? All right. Study the Gospels, especially the Gospel of John. Once you learn to love, then we can talk about social justice, then we can talk about equality to all, then you'll be standing out, and then you'll be outrageous. All right? Now, I'm assuming everyone here tonight is outrageous in the good sense of the term. Okay? Now you say, well, I, I, I am outrageous, right? Are you admitting you're outrageous? Say I'm outrageous. Oh, I'm outrageous. outrageous. Okay, good. So that means that I want you to be more outrageous. I want you to exist as much as you possibly can. All right? And how can you do that? Well, if we study other people who were outrageous, all right? You have this great picture of John Paul II and he's smiling. How great. How great John Paul II was. And then later on, if you get a minute, talk to Sister Mary DeBacco. She knew him up front and personal. Okay? She did so well, she knew him, and he did so much good. All right, so John Paul II, what made him great? He followed his inspiration. He got the inspiration, and he accomplished it. We're here tonight because of his inspiration. His other encyclical, Ex Corte Ecclesi, which strengthened and, de and defended the Catholic University, led to these types of conferences. Mother Teresa, if she didn't follow her inspirations, think of all the good that would have never been done. All right. Mother Angelica, happy memory. <laughs> if Mother Angelica didn't follow her inspirations, there'd be no Catholic television. All right. Unheeded inspirations are the, are the greatest danger to your life. All right. Unheeded inspirations are the greatest danger to your life. Think of Moses. All right. So Moses gets out of his tent and he goes to see the burning bush. But he goes back in his tent and he says, I'll go back out later after the game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah? No. You think God's going to light up a second bush? It's not going to happen. <laughs> the inspiration comes. The inspiration is for you. You know on your phone when you get a text, it's ding. That's what God's doing. When he's giving you an inspiration, ding, do it. Write it down. Within five seconds, write it down. You're going to have a whole pocket full of little junky papers, but it's okay. <laughs> write it down within five seconds, and then later on, later on, make a plan and follow it through. Okay, that's what you want to do. So, I'm about to tell you some unbelievable stories about children who are orphans from the disease of AIDS, all right? I'm going to tell you about some little girls, six to nine years old in Brazil, who are trafficked, and I'm going to tell you about some awful things that are happening here, right here, 15 minutes from here, all right? These children need our mercy, all right? Pope Francis declared it the year of mercy. The best definition I've heard of mercy all right, the best definition I've heard of mercy, and I can't remember what it is. <laughs> got it right here. All right, this is it. Mercy is entering into the chaos of another. Is that great? Mercy is entering into the chaos of another. And that's what I want you to do. I want you to be able to enter into the chaos of these children. All right? It may seem daunting at first because the problems are so immense, but if you listen closely, you'll be able to figure out what is it God wants you to do. And you know, it will change history. If you don't follow your inspirations, you're changing history. God is giving to this to you, this inspiration, whatever it is, to help in any way you can. You've got to do it. It's up to you. I had a young woman, college woman, write to me, email, and she said, Oh, sister, I'd love to help the children, but the only thing I can do is play the flute. The only thing she could do is play the flute. Well, since that email, she's opened a flute school in Ethiopia. She's had our children at the mission playing their flutes on Ethiopian television. And today she's a professor in the University of Mekele in Ethiopia. All right? That's following your inspirations. All right? Don't say, I can only play the flute. Whatever God gave you to do, it's great. That's the gift you've got to use. Yeah, and you have to use the gift God gave you, but it has to be fun for you, too. If it's not fun, then it's going to be work, all right? I don't want you to ever go to work, 
Okay? I want you to have fun. When I come back here five years from now, I want you to be rich alumni sitting here, all right? I don't want to go see you sorting socks at the Gap. I want to see you owning the Gap so that we can help people that don't have nice clothes like that. All right? That's what, that's what you want to do, okay? So, uh, another example. Do you like to run? All right? We had this group of runners. They did a 135-mile race through the jungles of Brazil. Right? And they raised enough money, they did, they raised enough money to build a beautiful gym for the girls there. All right? So pick out, what can you do? Can you sing, can you dance, can you sew, can you eat? What, what can you do <laughs> that you can help the children? All right? That's what you want to do. That's what you want to do to help the children. All right? and, and it is frightening, and that's great. If your inspiration is frightening, it's like, yeah, this, I've got to do it. All right? And don't leave it, don't, don't settle, don't settle. All right, do it. All right. So don't let these opportunities pass you by. I beg you, respond with love, exist, and be outrageous. All right, we're going to videotape. Okay. Moving. <laughs> How we'll do this is that I have it in three sections, and I'll I'll do a section, and then if you have questions, and then we'll go on to the next section because if I go all the way to the end, you'll be all asleep. <laughs> Whatever, so um, we'll do it section by section. I'll bring this to you. Thank you. I'll take care of that for you. Go ahead. No, I'll leave it fine. No, I'll help you. I'm sorry. Okay, come on. Oh, oh, okay. You sure will. Before I start telling you about the children, <laughs> two outrageous women. All right, on your left is Blessed Maria Angela, founder of the Felician Sisters, and on the right is St. Lucy Filipini. Great, 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 outrageous and crazy, crazy. The coincidence is they, they were about 150 years apart. St. Lucy Filipini is a little older. Blessed Angela is from Poland. St. Lucy was from Italy. But from a, a young age, they knew what they wanted to do, all right? And they were both well educated. St. Lucy was an orphan and her aunt and uncle raised her, but Blessed Mother, uh, Blessed Maria Angela, her mother and father were able to raise her. And they both learned how to read and write. And they both felt bad that everybody else in the neighborhood could not read and write. And so that's what they did. They helped the poorest people around them, all right? Very interesting. Both of them in their writing said, I wish that I could be, multiply myself a thousand times so that they could get so much else done, you know? November 21st was a big day in their life, the Blessed Mother. The Blessed Mother said yes, she didn't say how, all right? So you're worrying about these inspirations? Just say yes, God, I heard the inspiration. Don't ask how, he'll tell you how to do it, all right? They both had love for adoration of the Eucharist, number one thing, they prayed, but then they also went to work. They were both really outrageous women whose lives continue today, and may we, all of us here, continue on the good work that they did. And I'll, I'll battle on during the movie and stop every now and then. Religious teacher Phil Heaney, a little cartoon of Kent Lucy. That's a little too loud. The book is called AIDS Orphans Rising. Yes, the numbers are rising, but I called it that because I want the children to rise out of their awfulness. A little lower the sound, please. So, for years we helped children that were orphans from war. This is our school in Ethiopia, bombed one year to the day by the Eritreans. Uh, and I, you never realize this, I never realize this, when there's a war, you know who's left? The nuns and the kids. 
That's it. All right, there's no food, there's no water, you've got to figure out what to do. You see Sister Mary DeBacco there in the picture, so talk to her later, she knows a lot about these things. And so, war orphans, they're tough little dudes. <laughs> War orphans, though, they can cry. Orphans from AIDS can't cry. They can't cry because everybody else is an orphan from war. War orphans can ask for help. War orphans can ask for help. Orphans from AIDS, when they go into school, they come in, they sit down, and they sit at their desk, and they just put their head down and cry. A war orphan, when they went to school, all the other kids gather around and say, oh, yeah, you should see my house, it blew up, you know, or they shot somebody or something like that, you know. But when the orphan from AIDS, they just sit down and they put their head down because everybody in the room is suffering from the same thing. The orphans from AIDS don't have even that bit of consolation. Now all the orphans that we help are, are orphans from AIDS. In this city, city, little town of Zalambasa, there are 700 orphans from AIDS. In the diocese, there are 70,000. These are the numbers this year. Why am I doing this? I want to burn them in your brain, okay? Because some people have never heard this before. 13 million in the world. Two million in South Africa. You know what an orphan is? No mother and father. That means you have nothing to eat, no place to sleep, all right? And you're depending on your aunt and uncle, but if there are two million orphans, guess how many aunts and uncles are left? There are more than a million in Tanzania, Nigeria, hundreds of thousands in Ethiopia, Uganda, Congo, 54,000 orphans in the United States. Do you believe it? One time I did this uh, program and somebody in the back stood up and said, none of this is true, okay? All of this is true, all right? I've taken all the pictures, so any pictures you see are true. And where are these 54,000 in the United States? Why don't we see them? Because we have foster care. And we have all these privacy rules that you're not allowed to say where these orphans came from. So a lot of times foster children are orphans from AIDS. And there are many, many of them. We, we don't see them on the street, but if you go to the other countries, when we land in India, and if we land in Mumbai, Mumbai used to be called Bombay, if you land in Mumbai and you switch airports from international to domestic, you get on a rickshaw and you go to the domestic airport, and it's always at 2 in the morning. I don't know why they always make you land at 2 in the morning, but you land at 2 in the morning, you get on this rickshaw, you're dead tired, they're driving you, and the minute you hit a red light, you're swarmed by at least 100 to 200 children swarming your rickshaw, saying, I'm hungry, this, and they're crying, and the rickshaw driver gets out with a stick and he beats the children off so that we can go on to the next red light and have the next thing happen. From 91, 97, the World Bank, uh, UN, everybody, don't say anything about the kids, all right? Because we're going to find a cure. 216, 2016, no cure, and lots of kids. And instead of a 24-hour McDonald's in Adi Ethiopia, we have a 24-hour coffin shop run by a 16-year-old boy. Funerals every day. Every 15 seconds, a child-headed household is formed. A CHH, is that the coldest thing you've ever seen in your life? I'll show you what a CHH is. This is a CHH, a child-headed household. Children left behind, their mothers and fathers have died from the disease. They don't have the disease, their mothers and fathers died from it. This little child-headed household, they live in this little house in the back. Can you see it? They, uh, yeah. See the little door? Okay. We rent it $3 a month, and this little child-headed household family lives in there. She's the oldest. She's in charge, so we pay her to come to school. Why do we pay her to come to school? Because if we didn't, she would turn to any office to feed these other little ones, because they'll be starving. So they come to us, and we help them. Perhaps 
you want to be a sister. I love to be a sister, all right? It's a wonderful thing, but it has to be, God has the call. You just can't wake up and say, okay, I'll go be a nun. You know, it's God, you've got to have a religious thing to do it, too. All right, so this is Suzette, all right? She loves this. Every morning she goes out, and on our wall, next to our wall, our children are sleeping because their mothers and fathers have died, but usually the last parent has died. And so she goes out, and she figures out, are we going to rent a house for this little family, or are they coming in with us? If they're too small, they come and live with us until they're strong enough to live out, out in the world. Just to throw it in, India, this year we'll have three million new ones. New ones. This should keep you up tonight, if nothing else. All right? If you thought the Slumdog Millionaire movie was good, wait till you see the next one. <laughs> this is our new orphanage. We opened, we had room for 120 children. The day we opened without any advertising, 240 children showed up. They are not child-headed households. They're singular children. They're not brothers and sisters. They're just little kids off the street. Bangalore. Bangalore is the outsourcing capital of the world. Have you ever been to Bangalore? Bangalore, when you land, the airport is beautiful. The whole city is white for about one mile. And then you go outside of it, it's like you fall off the face of the earth. All right? There's just orphans everywhere. Okay? So th these kids need your help. Everywhere needs your help. Even a Barbie made it there. This little one, so cute, a little girl. She was on a highway. It was like 95, four or five lanes all the way across. What she would do is she'd run across, do flips, and then come back again with her hand like this for, for you know, some money, whatever people gave her. So we saw this happening. So when we got up there and she did it in front of us, we grabbed her and put her in the Jeep, so now she's with us. <laughs> <laughs> it's the cutest thing. A little bit of abduction. <laughs> and we're today, we're today, now we're back to Africa. This little guy, he's head of the household. He's got two little sisters. He's got cows. His big problem, he has no water. His buddy has the same problem. These boys go to school half a day. They take care of their brothers and sisters. They take care of the farm animals. And you complain you have homework. Sister Howard Blaney is going right to heaven. Of course, someone else says, why don't you get a ladder for those kids in case they fall in? Yes, someone gave me money one day, and we do have a ladder there now for them. He's the cutest little boy. Sister said to him, come in, we'll give you new clothes, take a shower, get all cleaned up. Oh, no, no, if my sisters don't have enough water to drink, how could I waste water by, you know, washing my clothes, all right? He knows how to kill a cow. Before his father died, he taught him how to do it. He's got a little silver hammer, and he's whacking him in the head, and then he cuts it up uh -huh. into ribs and steaks, and he wraps it, and he labels it, and he brings it over to the condo. And the night he kills a cow, it smells like barbecue heaven because there's no refrigeration out here. And everybody, there's a big feast when they kill a cow. But it's like, hey, look at how old he's, like 10. He knows how to do all this stuff. <laughs> This is a place called Hamamalo. Their homes are called Too Cool. And this is a shepherd boy. His father had left him five camels before he died. Two thousand. Now, this is the new mayor. He's been elected. There are 1,500 <laughs> children here. Every two years, they vote a new mayor. They're saying five. He's not. He's eleven. He's okay. guy. He's the richest man in town. Let me tell you. And he's tough. He's good. He's the man. All right. Richest guy in town. He was voted mayor. And whenever there's trouble in the town, they go to his hut. And you remember the old book, uh, Three Cups of Tea. All right. Well, and he filters three cups of coffee, and it is the strongest stuff you ever want. And they filter it with camel hair tail thing, so it's a little unnerving. <laughs> and so he solves the problem in his little hut. If he can't solve the problem, then they walk over to the common sister Antonia solves the problem. You know, and so but she allows them, you know, the freedom to try to solve the problem. And one day, some, one of the men at the salt mine, that's how they make the money, there's a salt mine nearby, so they load up the camels and the kids take it wherever it has to go and they make their money. One of the adults at the salt mine took one of the camels. 
So the kids, they decided, all 1,500 of them, walked to the area. They found the guy. They pummeled him. They didn't kill him, sister. We didn't kill him. We didn't kill him. They got the camel back, but um, there was justice. <laughs> Many of them go to work and go to school. Uh, this one, this one kills me. So sweet. A lot of times when the mother and father die, all the children would of the same family come into the convent, all right? And the problem with that is if they leave their farm, the unscrupulous relatives take over the farm the minute they leave. So we've taught the children now, when your mother and father, whoever the last adult is, dies, everybody stay in the house except one of you, come get us. So then we go back and we, you know, make sure that they're stable there. We give them a man that helps them with the farm. And sister told this little family, if you make a profit on your wheat, you can stay in your farm. So they're coming back. They sold all the wheat. They're all happy, and so they can stay in their farm. And so they're they're um, they're good to go. They're going to make it. They work really hard, but they go to school too. So you kids, you know, you work hard and you go to school. The egg man, cute. He came to us when he was six. He has three little sisters. All right? He loved working with the eggs with sisters. Sister Mary didn't tell us about him. Everything she knew about the eggs, all right? Today he's 15, he's got his own house, he's got 300 chickens, he, and he's like Mr. Tyson Chicken of the area. You know, he's got, he's got the market. And so, uh, but he learned, he learned to give back. He comes once a week with a little chest of eggs for sisters so she can get another little boy going to sell the eggs. We found this little boy and girl sleeping under that blue tarp in the back. Usually, we, you know, you wrap that stuff around your coat. Grandma, poor grandma. Wow. Grandma, she had ten children. All right? They grew up and got married. They had their own children. Her ten children have died from AIDS. Their spouses have died from AIDS. She has over 50 grandchildren who come every day to school and, you know, the sisters try to help them. But she's the main one of the family. So the grandmothers are having a very hard time. We teach them a skill. Sewing, we teach them anything, many things. All right, I think these are Jersey girls, okay? These are girls, their parents died, they were older. They had some money, they had a nice farm. The parents died, and here they are. They're 14, 15 years old. They haven't a clue how to do anything, except shop, maybe. You know? They don't. So we have a school, we actually have two schools like this, where the sisters teach them many skills, and when they graduate, sister says to them, well, you know, what would you like to do? And well, if they like pizza making, if you only have one road, you drive down a couple hundred miles, you build a pizza hut, give them an ice cream machine, and they're good to go. You know, it's a good thing. So, support micro enterprise. This is their exam for sewing, or making the, um, pattern, really. And they graduate. They go into co-op with sewing for a few months, and then when they're sick of the other girls, they open their own shop. <laughs> Sister Medbrack, she's going to heaven. They have cookies. Now, this is Eritrea. Eritrea was conquered by Italy years ago, and they love Italian food. So, we teach them how to cook Italian food. The girl with the red jacket on. What are you making now? The biscotti, right? So she has a red jacket on. She came crying one day and she said, Sister, I, I feel so terrible. I feel so terrible. I said, well, what happened? What happened? She said, well, they brought all my biscotti. I said, don't feel terrible. I said, go make more. You know? <laughs> she didn't get it. <laughs> <laughs> so they opened her own little shop, coffee and biscotti. Here they're making lasagna. Wow. What is this? Right? Mm. And it's good. A lasagna. Oh, okay. This is uh, getting ready to make lasagna. And how many did they make this dinner for? This is their exam. Okay, and remember, they have little brothers and sisters at home, too, that they have to worry about. Somebody in Italy gave me an industrial gelato machine. Now, that's a great idea, isn't it? So I got it to Adegar, Ethiopia. I forgot. There's no electricity there. 
So we opened this pizza school where the girls learn how to dress and set the table and things like that. So we bought a generator. So we have a generator that keeps the freezer going, but we don't have any, any light. But it'll, it gets a little dark, but it'll get a little light enough. We found these cool knives. And the girls make their own napkins, tablecloths, everything. So here's the mango flavored ice cream, very good. Now the orphans can have as much ice cream as they want, they can have as much pizza as they want, they can come in off the street only at this shop. The other shops are for making money. This one is for teaching, so you know, maybe it doesn't taste as good as the other shop, but it is good, they're good. So the kids come in off the street. So sweet the girls, you know, this is their life. Now here's Sister Lexi. She's trying to get at these little guys, lick it, and they're going, no, it's cold. They've never eaten anything cold in their life. And they're like, no, I don't want to do this. The little guy's trying, but he's like, no, I don't want to do it. And then she says, come on. So they're trying, and then they're like, hmm, pretty good. Hmm, it's good. Ah, so that's good. And they'll be back. They'll be back. So that's the end of the section on the child-headed household, the orphans. I don't know if any of you have any questions on them. Okay, how do they all get to be orphans? Yes. Oh, here. What? Here you go. Don't make it too hard. These are prepared questions. I have to prepare. Thank you, Sister, for that uh, wonderful uh, video so far that we've seen. Um, so community service plays a large role in all, a lot of the work you do. So what are some of the impacts that the children have had on you as you continue to work with them? Making my life better, you mean? Yeah. Oh, my, their work ethic. They work like crazy, and they're loving. They're loving how they love their little brothers and sisters. I, I, I always think in the United States, if we had some awful tragedy like that, would we stay together as brothers and sisters, or would we scatter? Because Ethiopia is very different. The other countries, they scatter. India and Brazil, what I see is when the mother and father die, the children all go off on their own. But in Ethiopia, somehow the mothers and fathers got that into those kids. We are a family, you know? And I think it's because in Ethiopia, they have, it's just mainly farming. And what happens is something goes wrong on the farm. And the mm -hmm. father takes the truck to Addis Ababa, about eight hours away, and he pulls around the girl. Right? He already has a wife back home with five or six kids, all right? But he really loves her, but he goes through whatever. He pulls around, he's got the AIDS, he comes back, gives it to the wife. They mm. conceive a new baby. And you know AIDS doesn't show up tomorrow. You've got to wait four or five years. So like four or five years later, he's getting skinnier, skinnier, skinnier. And that's what they call it out here. They don't know, they don't know, you know, science. They call it the skinny disease. So, oh gosh, dad has a skinny disease, he dies, the new baby dies, and then the mother dies. All right? Mm. It's not because they don't love each other. It's because he fooled around. And what's amazing to me is this is a Christian country with the Sixth Commandment. Did someone forget to teach us? Mm -hmm. Good? Yes. Thank you so much, Sister. Right, good. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. Is that how they all got AIDS? Well, various ways. Because <laughs> you're telling me most of your parents died from age. Yes, because most of the men went and got it somewhere else and brought it back to the mother. And it's the new baby that died because the other children were not involved in any of that. Good to go? On to the next? All right, next we're going to talk about Brazil. Oh, I forgot this. Remember the flute school? This is cool. Here we are, Ethiopian television. These are girls, all orphans from AIDS, who learned how to play the flute. A couple guys. Guess how they make their money? Playing at funerals. There's this the young girl. I don't know how to do anything but play the flute. And yourself, what is it the only thing you can do? That's what the kids need. We're heading off to Brazil now. It's a place two and a half hours south of São Paulo. We have 78 little girls here, all right? And what has happened here in this town, the only thing in this town is a big bus station 
And if you're going from anywhere in southern South America, Argentina, Paraguay, Uruguay, you have to stop at this bus station before you get to Sao Paulo, all right? And so people bring their little girls there to sell them to people at the bus station, all right? And so what the sisters do is they go and we watch, and you say, we watch, and the little girl is sold, and you say to the guy, well, how much did you pay for that little girl? And he'll usually say five reals, which is like three dollars. And you say, well, I'll give you ten. And he's like, oh, yeah, you can have her, all right? And so we've been doing this since 1992, all right? We've seen, we've had some happy endings because we have doctors and psychiatrists and all that help the girl. They go on and, you know, they can go to school and college and be lawyers and doctors and things like that. But these are little girls, six to nine years old. There's an urban myth that if you have sex with a little, if you have AIDS and you have sex with a little girl, you're going to get better. All right? And so a lot of them are doing this. So some of the little girls do get AIDS too. So that's mm -hmm. some of the sets. They're counting off here. They sell their little girls to feed the rest of the family. A heartbreak. So religious people are still feeding with your health. By a safe haven, food, clothing, education, and love for all the little girls. And the project is called Luciana, it's after St. Lucy. Mm. So, all the girls at risk in Rita Kasu. When they come, they're very scared and sad. Now, these are older ones, so they've been there a while. With time and God's grace, they can get their life back. I don't know if they're ever normal again, but they can be happy and laugh again. This is their May procession to the Blessed Mother. I want you to look at their little faces. They've been through hell, and they haven't even made their first communion. Little ones. <laughs> Raise your hand. Cheer for them. <laughs> they, they go into these homes and we provide beds and 
whatever people need for them, all right? You don't realize people are sleeping on the floor. Brand new babies, you realize when you come out of the hospital, you have to have a car seat when you come out of the hospital, right? If you don't have one, you can't take the baby home, all right? We had a lady, she got the car, she didn't have a car seat, but she took herself out of the hospital, put the baby on the front seat of the car. She remembered on her way home, I need something, so she stopped at the shop and left a brand new baby on the front seat of the car. So, of course, you know, the police took the baby and all of this happened. So by the time we, they called us and said, oh, please come help them, we got in her house. The baby, 10-day-old baby, is sleeping on top of a garbage bag. She had absolutely nothing in the apartment. Right? So girls, they need a lot of education. They need uh, stuff. It's funny that, you know, we have so much stuff, you know, but they need uh, essential things. <laughs> Many kids sleep on the floor, try it. Many kids have no refrigerator. Or very little in the one they have. You probably have more on the door of your refrigerator than these people have in the whole refrigerator. This was last week, so it's not like I'm making this stuff up. <laughs> So I get a good bunch of guys, road dogs, they help me move all the stuff. Whatever. We spoke about this, the Christmas party for the mothers. A mother said to me, sister, I have nothing Christmas morning. So we have this party in Newark every year. They have to be really, really poor. We have, we were in their homes. We know they have nothing. <laughs> so if you want to help us with this party, that'd be fun too. In the gym, we have nice things for them. Jumpies. This is Christy gets us these test trucks. They like that. Santa does give the kids one present. And in the back, we have clothes and toys. That's a jumpy. We have clothes and toys that we wrap up, and the girls, the mothers take them home. So on Christmas morning, they have something. So you could have a party like this. We have a literacy fair for the kids, the little Hispanic kids. Free books, eye exams, library cards, and more. They're very happy. Little guy, all the books. If he gets ten words, that's great. His vocabulary will increase tremendously. And we provide for new mothers. We hang out at the Wick. Here's one of our stars. We provide diapers and clothes, whatever the mothers need. You know, sometimes it's a choice at the end of the month between diapers and food. Do you ever know that? Do you know how expensive diapers are? You know? And if you don't have a clean one, oh, right, we'll just leave the old one on. Oh, this is incredible. When I was in Albania, Albania, you know, I, so one day I should come and just talk to you about Albania. We went in the room and they had the brand new infants and they had two, two like a glass box, a plastic box, two babies. They had their ear and in the middle and they're tied together with one diaper. So I'm walking around and I said to the doctor, are they Siamese twins or something? He said, no, we don't have enough diapers. Ooh. Did you get that? And we offer a financial peace course. Put your money in order. So, in conclusion, all right? In conclusion, I say to you, please, when you get an inspiration, within five seconds, write it down. Make a plan. Accomplish it. These children need you. Enter into the chaos of their lives. Remember this story. This story helps me a lot. You've heard it. The little boy's walking along the shore and he sees a thousand starfish and there's a little old man and he's picking one up gently and throwing it back in. And he says, the little boy says to him, old man, what are you doing? And he says, well, the tide went out and these starfish are all going to die if we don't get them back in the water. And the, the boy said, old man, you're not going to do this. There's thousands of them. You're not going to do it. There are too many. You're not going to make any difference at all. And the old man looked at him sadly and he bent down and he picked up the starfish and he threw it in gently and he said it'll matter to this one, all right? So that's what I want you to do. I want you to be loving, exist, stand out, and be outrageous. Thank you.
just for those who might um, have this question in their mind, how could they get involved with uh, your group? I mean, from what you showed, it's largely sisters doing these things. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I don't expect that there are enough of you always to go around. You've got all these millions of children, so how can yeah. a person no, who's not a Philippines, you know, like yeah. someone here, Felicia, who might say, you know, I want to right. invite summer or volunteer or whatever. Yeah. Some are good because in India, school starts in June, and we had a group of uh, Seton Hall seminarians went. There were eight of them that went, so we do take boys to whoever wants to. We had three or four other guys that came from West Point who went also to India. The reason I suggest India is because they speak English, you know, makes it easier. But you're also welcome in Brazil or Ethiopia or Eritrea also. If anyone wants to do it, in your book has my email and things like that. You can write to me. The Felician Sisters have missions. You can help them. You can help us right here. Sister Amory Paul on the place of Pacific, where she could use a lot of help, and that's only, you could probably run there. <laughs> As we were driving here, I said, wow, we were looking at some apartments. I said, oh, but these people need a mattress, you know? There's lot, there are people right here outside your door that could use some help. Yeah. So if you write to me, we'll figure out what you can do. Yes, I have a question. Good yes. evening. Um, my name is Kevin Cataldo. I'm a sophomore here at Felicia University and a student in school education. Um, sister, oftentimes I find myself feeling helpless and useless despite being determined to educate urban students. What do you suggest I should do when I get these feelings? They tend to take over my mind. Get rid of them. Go run. Get rid of them. Yeah, yeah. No, make it yourself. God, what did you give me? What, what gift do I have, all right? Have that list ready, all right? And then say, what do I love to do, all right? And then go make somebody else happy doing whatever it is you're good at. The minute you have that down feeling, oh, life is awful, life is awful, or go do something for somebody else, you know? Okay. Thank yeah, you. That's the best way, I think. Uh, if someone else has a better suggestion. Yes. Yes. Um, I'm from York. Good. I noticed the Christmas party picture yeah. was my old high school. That's right. Yeah. What a great high school. Yeah, and I found it really ironic that the students would never ever like informed about that or anything. And I was wanted to know. Because it wasn't for them. Yeah, well, I know it's for other people, for like donations and stuff. But like, how would we find out about that? Like, yeah, about in your book, it's my email, and you can you can write to me, and okay. that's it. And we use we actually use the baseball team. Initially, we used the baseball team and the basketball team. And it was interesting, we invited 12 families from this high school because they were in need, and not one of the 12 showed up. Mm -hmm. So, you know, mm -hmm. cool. Yes, oh. Yes, please. Clothes and things like that? Anything. Anything. Just my name and my address, everything's in the book. Be happy to write to that. There's a group in South Carolina. I received a box today. These are older women, all retired. They love to sew, and they make me pretty, pretty little dresses, all right? And so I send them to Cuba, to our missions, Ethiopia, Eritrea, whatever it is. And these women are so happy. They're doing something they love to do, a simple little dress, and off it goes, you know? Find out something that you love to do. Don't sit idle. Yeah. And I'd be happy to um, hear from you. Yes. Yes, Do you remember the security man, Wahoo? Yes. He was in charge. Yes. So tell him you'll help him. Oh, this one. Oh, okay. Wahoo's about 8 feet tall. Yes. He gets a baseball team to carry, and they're not allowed to play unless they come help him. That's it, I think. All right, so be outrageous, please. Thank you. My name is Ed Olu. I'm the Vice President for Academic Affairs uh, this evening. And um, I want to point out just a mistake we have in our program. I'm going to give closing remarks. Um, but I intend my remarks not to be closing, but continuing remarks. Okay. The Kingdom of God is at hand. These are some of uh, my favorite words from the Bible to illuminate that the kingdom of God is at hand. It makes me wonder, what does that mean? Tonight, I, I have a glimpse, sister, of what I think that means. Through your acts of mercy, you and our other sisters, 
we see how you have entered into the chaos of others. And I, I saw the smiles. I, I saw the dignity. Uh, for me, I saw a transformation. And, and I think I got a glimpse of the kingdom of God being at hand. Sister was honored by the Path to Peace Foundation. And they bestowed upon her the title Servitor Pachis, Servant of Peace. Servant of Peace. Sister and sisters, thank you for being wonderful models for us. Thank you for your witness of meaningful ways to help others find and create a future of peace. Thank you for the inspiration. Truly, the kingdom of God is at hand. Please join us.